so, so excited to get into this one in particular. But before we dive in, a couple of bits. First of all, make sure you check out our podcast that drops every Tuesday on, well, basically wherever you follow your podcasts. We have some incredible interviews already available on the channel as well. And we've got a few amazing ones lined up. So make sure that you are subscribed to that one. Folks, we are very nearly at 300,000 subscribers. 300,000. That's incredible. And that is because of you. It's because people who like, share and subscribe. So please, if you can, make sure that you are subbed to this channel and please make sure that you're sharing videos as well. It makes such a difference. You may not believe me, but if one person shares a video, that makes a difference. So thank you so much to everyone who is doing that. Shall we discuss one of the biggest episodes of Star Trek overall? That's right, we're here with all the ups and downs for all good things. Now I'm gonna be straight with you just before I start. This episode is daunting because not only is it one of the better finales that Star Trek has ever offered, it's also got 30 years of history and with the release of Star Trek Picard, there has been continuations post what this was supposed to be, which is the finale. So there's an awful lot to get through. We will, of course, be going through our temporal observations at the end of the video as well. I say the end of the video. I'd say it's going to make up a fair chunk of the video. So, so just enjoy is all I can say. Straight into it. Right. I want to go with my first up of the episode, which is it has one of the best cold opens, I think, of any episode. It's nice and straightforward. Troy and Worf walking off the holodeck, going on a date. They've just been the, at the Black Sea, which Worf found very stimulating. We then immediately get Picard running through the ship in his bare feet. That great moment of the date. I need to know the exact date. Start date 47988. I'm moving backwards and forwards through time. Brilliant. Because it's straight away, it grabs you. And it's really engaging and it really brings you into the mystery of the episode. Although I don't remember it well, I won't lie to you, I can imagine back in 1994, where I was watching it, that feeling of not only is this a great mystery, but this is potentially the last mystery. Yes, okay, you would have heard of Star Trek Generations, but you know, this is the last episodic adventure of the next generation crew. And to start so strong is, is excellent. Now, it also gives me my first down of the episode, which is Deanna and Worf. Never worked for me. Uh, I still don't think it works. And not just because I think Deanna and Riker are endgame, which they totally are, but it's not just that. I just thought, what an odd pairing. We look forward and we know that Worf has, you know, other relationships that work an awful lot better. But we also, it just never quite felt right. It felt a little bit of a, let's just push these two together. And it sets up another thing that I really don't like in this episode. So most definitely the pairing of Deanna and Worf is a down from me. We get the opening credits, they pass and we get uh, Picard in Troy's quarters. And he's trying to remember, like holding on to a dream, this, you know, the, the bits of memory, you know, what, where, where has he been? What has he done? He, he remembers being an old man in the future and then he remembers being younger and and, and the frustration is so palpable because up, oh, Patrick Stewart delivers one of his finest performances as Picard in this episode. I cannot heap enough praise on Patrick Stewart enough. He, he just brings his absolute A game for the entirety of the story. And again, it starts so strong, but it doesn't let up because you would think that perhaps maybe, maybe in the middle it kind of sags. It doesn't. Patrick Stewart is an amazing part of this story, which of course he had to be. I mean, it's all about Picard, really, all good things. Yes, everyone else has some crucial parts, but it really is, at its core, it's a Picard story. It's fabulous. As he's trying to explain to Troy the, the differences in time, of course, he turns around and, where is he? He's in the future. He's tying up vines in Labar. And this is, I like that during the next generation, and straight through into Picard, this is a consistent thing. It's like, we know where Picard's gonna end up, and that's at the vineyard. And it makes sense. Straight away watching it, you're like, yeah, that's exactly where he would be. He would, he would go home 
on his terms once he's done all of his exploring. And then we get the arrival in the future of Geordie. LeVar Burton looks fabulous, aged up. So this is set in 2395. So it's been 20 years since, you know, they were last on board the Enterprise. And you have to remember that in the context of all good things, it's 25 years later. Uh, obviously, we know with the movies that, yeah, they were all together more recently, but not in this timeline. So he arrives and, and they talk about the fact that, you know, Geordi now has three, not two, three children. We'll address that in Temporal Observations. And Geordi's wife is Leah. Damn. Although her surname is not said on screen, it has time and again, it's Leah Brahms. And this is a down for me because at the time, throughout the time since and recently, LeVar Burton has described how uncomfortable Geordie's storyline with Leah Brahms made him. If we look back to episodes like Booby Trap and again with Galaxy's Child, Geordie was at his worst when he was paired, you know, holographic or no, with Leah Brahms. He, there was a very strong incel vibe about him. It was an uncomfortable storyline. And to ensure that in this version of the future, Jordy is then married to Leah Brahms, this to me suggests that, oh, you know, just keep stalking, you'll get there eventually. It's deeply uncomfortable, it's deeply unpleasant, and it's why, for me, this is my trellium down of the episode. Because it's just included as a throwaway line, it's totally superfluous, and it continues the massacre of Geordi's character. Picard and Geordi, they, they bounce off each other. In fact, there's a nice scene where you know, Picard's trying to encourage Geordi to call him Jean-Luc, and I'm gonna come back to that one. They sort of discuss Picard's eromodic syndrome. I'm going to talk about it throughout this section of the ups and downs, but I'm, I'm, I'm gonna save what, uh, the most thing I have to say about it for the temporal observations. And if you've seen Picard, I, I think you can understand why I'm gonna hang on till there. So uh, it is going to be addressed, but eromodic syndrome is a degenerative condition that is analogous to dementia or Alzheimer's. So to hear that in 2395, Picard is suffering from advanced eromodic syndrome, you know, his friends dropping in to see on to see him and see how he's getting on. It's it's quite sad, really, because it is this idea of we all age, and much as we would all love to retain control of all of our faculties, that will not be the case for all of us. So it is quite a poignant storyline to add to this episode. As Picard also says to Geordi, I'm not dead yet, you know, don't treat me as if I am. I am fine, I am here, let's talk about you. And so they talk about Geordi has started writing and I started writing novels. And Picard says, oh, I read your most recent novel. I, I found the protagonist much too flamboyant. Down, everyone's a bloody critic. This scene for me, it then turns into one of my favorite scenes of the episode. And it's a whopper of an up to the return of Denise Crosby as Tasha Yar. Now, it's, it's, as I say, it's been 30 years. You know, we know Tasha's in the finale and we know it's great and it's fantastic, but I want us to try and imagine what it was like in 1994. So this character who had been around for most of the first year had then left. We had references to throughout the remainder. Of course, we had Sela as well. So, and of course, yesterday's Enterprise. So Denise Crosby had appeared again, but not so much Yar. Again, exception of yesterday's Enterprise. To bring her back and make her such an important part of the finale, to me, I think is a stroke of brilliance. And it's a fabulous, a fabulous way of honoring the show overall. So it's a whopper of an up from me. And added to that, she delivers a fabulous performance in this episode, arguably one of her best as Yar. I thought it was an excellent decision. While this scene takes place on the shuttle and Picard is a little overcome with emotion, and then seeing, seeing the Enterprise D for the first time, of course, we then get the reversion to the present. Picard's being examined by Dr. Crusher and there is, there's a brilliant scene here between Crusher and Picard. And I wanna give an up to Gates McFadden. 
Not solely for this scene, Gates McFadden is fabulous throughout all good things, but from the ground, from the ground up, I should say, so she hits the ground running. That's what I was trying to say. From the beginning of this story, she has such an emotional bond with Patrick Stewart that the two characters, you can see that there was such a deep caring between them. Now, of course, we know after seven years, we knew that there would be this connection. We know ourselves that this is the whole history with Jack Crusher and the Stargazer and the episode attached even quite recently before this. They, they discovered that they had these feelings for each other. It's all brought here in such a way that reminds us just how connected these two are. And I have to say, I think that is largely down to how well Gates McFadden plays it in this episode. Asking Troy to step away for a moment, just, you know, you know, could you give us a second? And Troy does a funny little, oh, okay. But uh, she's delivering the news that yes, she has scanned Picard's brain and yes, she has found a defect. Picard goes, well, why do you look like you're signing my death warrant? You know from the beginning that I think Crusher believes before anyone else. Because she knows, she found, I think from the moment she found the defect, and she goes, I know what this is going to become. You know, he's been to the future, he's seen that it's aromatic syndrome, I, I know what this is going to become. And she effectively says as much later on, but from the beginning, I think it shows just how quickly she accepted Picard at his word. And again, that's crucial for the story as it goes on. Picard gets a hail from Admiral Nakamura, nice to see him again that there's some unusual activity in the Devron system, in the neutral zone. And we're well, actually, funnily enough, we get one of the, uh, the memes of Picard where he's kind of like, that's been memed to death, I love it. And it begins this mystery of what's happening in the Devron system. This then switches, of course, back to the future where Picard and Geordi are walking through the vines and Picard starts to see familiar figures from the past, although he can't quite place them. Now, there is an excellent little little exchange here, and it's just not long after Picard encourages Geordi to call him Jean-Luc, and Geordi says, oh, I don't know if I'll get comfortable with that. Look how quickly he reverted to captain. So as soon as Picard really started to show, from Geordi's point of view, his symptoms, Geordi fell back into that, I'm not entirely sure how to be your friend, your equal here, but I remember and I know how to work as a crew. I thought this was most definitely an up and I thought this was a really clever moment in the episode because going from toying with the idea of Jean-Luc to calling him captain again, it's like we're transported back in time. And I think it's an excellent addition. Now, Geordi says, right, we're, we're gonna get you some help. And, and Picard goes, I need to, need to talk to Data. I need to talk to Data. And Geordi says, all right, let's talk to Data. Where is he? We're at, he's at Cambridge. Let's go. We go to Cambridge and we get Jessel, who I love. Pamela Kosh. Uh, recently lost her in the last couple of years, but fantastic as Jessel. Fantastic as Mrs. Carmichael as well. Um, sorry, you know, tea or a great hot. Of course, it's bloody hot. What you want in it? Looks like a bloody skunk. Love it. Data, of course, now holds the Lucretian chair, which had previously been held by Sir Isaac Newton, who, of course, discovered the idea of Mavity. And having them here at Cambridge, which is this symbol of learning and this symbol of advanced knowledge, and of course it's Data. I, I love it. I also love the fact that, you know, Data's alive. And, of course, it's Data who takes Picard seriously second. If we say Crusher did it first, Data did it second because Data goes, well, I mean, of course, you could be suffering from the symptoms of aromotic syndrome or you could be telling us the truth. So let's let's investigate all aspects of it. And therefore, we will we'll get to the bottom of this. And I love it. And I love the fact that his room is absolutely covered in cats because a dozen bloody cats couldn't fill the hole that spot left behind. We then revert back to the past. The shuttle Galileo lands in the Enterprise-D shuttle bay and Yar announces the arrival of this brand new Captain Picard to the Enterprise-D. And it is so much fun because we see Worf there in his season one red. We see the space cheerleader herself, season one, Deanna Troy. Does anyone on earth like that wig? And then of course we get taken up O'Brien. 
Look, I don't know if it was a running gag at this point, but they've got his rank wrong again. Uh, because he's an ensign in this one, but he's not, because he's an enlisted man. And there's, there's entire forums on the ranking system of Chief O'Brien. And it's, it's, it's quite funny. This then, you know, Picard is there doing the whole, the taking command ceremony. You know, you, you know I, Jean-Luc Picard, I am hereby required and request to take him out of the Enterprise D, da 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 and starts to see these familiar creatures from his past again, these people jeering and shouting. So he declares red alert. And of course, this didn't happen in the past. So this is already a change to history. This cuts then to a scene of the observation lounge. Lovely to see the early version of the observation lounge in again. We got Troy, Yar and Worf then report that all decks require the report ready. And Picard starts to slip up because he orders Worf to do a task that should go to Yar, who is the tactical officer. And, I mean, I'll be frank with you, it's not a good look, Picard. Uh, but it just says, sorry, of course, of course it's you, Yar. You know, th th this is my, my apologies. It's quite funny that, you know, he walks out of the observation lounge and, you know, he discovers that the Farpoint mission has been cancelled and he's been ordered to the Devron system, or at least to the side of the neutral zone. He says, no, no, we'll continue on to Farpoint. The crew is like, sorry, what? You outrank Starfleet? No. You know, you have Troy tries to say, um, maybe you could explain your, your actions. And he's like, ha, nah. O'Brien, I believe you're having trouble with the engines. I believe I know how to fix them. This version, it works thematically, I guess, that, you know, why would you reveal future events to the past? And at this point of the story, sure, I understand. As the episode goes on, and there's a talk about a discontinuity between the different time periods, it's sort of, it's, although it leads to some fantastic scenes, it's a bit harder to understand. But anyway, they arrive down at engineering and Picard starts telling O'Brien, yep, listen, you know, you can do this and everything. And O'Brien's like, this is not my area of expertise. Of course, we know that Chief of Operations Miles O'Brien is currently keeping the tacky Cardassian fascist eyesore spinning in space. I believe he'll be fine. And Picard, although he doesn't say that, he does say, believe me, I know you can do this. He lets a little bit of a slip by saying, oh, I know you used to spend so much time building those model Starship engines as a child. And O'Brien quite rightly says, how do you know that? This leads us to the introduction of this time period's data. Uh, I do need to get it down out of the way. In the seven years between the airing of Encounter at Farpoint and All Good Things, they demoted data. In Encounter at Farpoint, he was a lieutenant commander. In All Good Things, when they go to the past, he's a lieutenant junior grade. Poor data. Justice for androids. We get that great scene of Ignite the Midnight Petroleum. And yeah, I, I, I really like it. Again, this is actors playing roles they are so comfortable in that it just works. Picard returns then to his ready room. Uh, Troy speaks to him about how, you know, the crew is a little bit unsteady with his orders. He explains himself a little bit better. He says that, look, I can't go into details, but I know what you're all capable of, and I know that you can do this. And we speak to Archive Riker. This is an up for me, because think about it. If you were gonna have Riker appear in the past as well, you gotta shave the beard. And that ain't happening. So they use footage from, I believe, the Arsenal of Freedom. I am happy to be challenged on that one, but I believe it's archive footage from that. And that's such a simple way of explaining him out of the past. Love it. And because he's in so much of the rest of the episode, it's not like we miss him in that period of time. Uh, plus, I'll be honest with you, season one Riker was kind of no crack at all. Back to the present, Picard is in the observation lounge with the crew giving instructions on what to do and this leads us to the the exchange between Riker, Troy and Worf and and this gets it down from me because this Riker versus Worf thing again just doesn't work for me and maybe I'm just feeding off the fact that I don't think Deanna and Worf were a good pairing I don't think it was necessary for the story I frankly it just makes Riker look like the jealous ex perhaps that was the exact intention but it doesn't come across very well and especially when it leads directly into Riker being quite distracted on the bridge. Picard's there, look, look, if I get distracted, you need to take control. You know, you need to be able to step straight into the breach. Will, yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, step into the breach, no problem. Yeah, okay, right, you're relieved of duty. So the whole point is you need to be able to step in. And it's not a, it's not a great moment, I didn't think. Picard then goes into his ready room, Crusher follows. 
this whole scene isn't up from me. For a lot of the reasons I've already said when I gave Gates McFadden herself an up, this scene is strong. I thought it was just fabulous, quite frankly. And this whole, a lot can happen in 25 years, at the time that was a promise. Now, well, we sort of know, don't we? Temporal observations. In the past, Picard brings the Enterprise to the coordinates where he originally encountered Q. I'll be honest, I don't know if I initially, initially, and again, I'm trying to remember 30 years ago here, but I don't know if I initially suspected Q. Of course, now it makes perfect sense. Q appeared in the pilot. And when he turns around and goes, Q! You know, it's like, ah, all right then. And that, you know, funny, you know, what is a Q? It's a letter of the alphabet for all I know. When he steps into, or off the bridge and into the trial, taken up, having that full circle, the trial never ended. That is a stroke of brilliance. I know there, there is a story behind the scenes that, you know, once John Delancey became aware it was the final season, you know, he went to, uh, I believe it was Michael Piller, and said, you know, I, I would really love to be in this final season. And he goes, don't worry, you are. Brilliant. Because I think Q is one of those characters from the next generation who is as important as any side character. And for the rest of the, the story, John Delancey and Patrick Stewart together are fabulous double act. In fact, let me just, I just want to up that now ahead of time. They're fabulous together because there is that slightly sinister edge to Q, but as Picard then later describes it as, there's a deadly earnestness. He's trying to help. He is bound by his own and the continuum's rules. We get these questions with yeses and nos, and, and it looks like Q's making fun of Picard. What I get here is a deep frustration from Q. And, you know, that Picard doesn't understand better. That in Q's words, that they have squandered their last seven years of exploration. That from humanity's point of view, perhaps they have done this thing where they've encountered strange new worlds and met new civilizations. But Q's like, sure, on the one level, you've got to think bigger. It's, uh, it's an ex, oh, it's, it's chills of an idea. When you get that by not doing that, by not being able to think outside the box, you have doomed humanity. And that, that great crescendo of music that finishes with Picard sitting in his ready room going, oh no, that is a, a fabulous way. And although All Good Things really is a TV movie, uh, you know, at one point it was aired in two parts and this was the end of part one. So do you know what, as a, as a cliffhanger, Taken up. Oh, before I move on from that one, Q says, we're gonna put an end to your trek through the stars. That's an up, and also that is a far better name drop than Zephyr Cochran saying, you're all astronauts on some kind of Star Trek, come fight me. There's a scene in the observation lounge where Picard is sitting there telling the senior staff about what happened. Down, buddy! Q literally said, I'll tell you if you promise not to tell anyone. You can't be trusted. And there's a scene moments later that just makes me grin as we move from one time period to another and you get Andreas Katsoulis who just, you know, just as Tom Ock goes, so Picard, how long shall we stare at each other across the neutral zone? Taken up, Riker take another down. Presumably you did not step into the breach there. Did you not read the brief? Picard suggests they each send one ship to the, the Devron system. Brilliant. And at this point, again, you know, just seeing Picard working with the Romulan so well, good sign of things to come. And I love that. Has Starfleet approved this plan? No, I like it already. Love it. Love it. I think it's brilliant. In the future, Picard is denied a ship by Admiral Riker. Poor old Jonathan Frakes looking a bit tired there, very grey. The filming of the documentary Journey's End, uh, which aired just after All Good Things, uh, there's a good gag in that, actually. It's, all, it's available on Netflix UK and Ireland, at least. Uh, there's a good gag in that where he's there in full makeup for this, saying, it's tiring being an actor, isn't it? Uh, but it's, 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 it's cool. But yes, he is denied a ship. So Data, who, quite frankly, if he stopped making these suggestions, maybe this anomaly would never have happened in the first place. But anyway, suggests, what about a medical ship? Because there's been an outbreak of Torellian plague on Romulus. There is now no more neutral zone in the future because the Klingon Empire have annexed the Romulan Empire. And Picard goes, ah, USS Pasteur. I have some pull with the captain. The captain is, of course, Captain Beverly Picard. I do love the future scenes an awful lot. Um, I think 
Everyone plays the roles so wonderfully. I think it's one of the best data with emotions uh, I think that we ever get. I think, I think Brent Spiner is actually fabulous in this episode. All the scenes on the Pastor are very, very strong. You know, leaving Earth, flying toward Hattoria, speaking to Old Age Worf. Um, and by the way, everyone who gave out about Worf with grey hair in Picard Season 3, hello. We get the reveal that Captain Beverly Picard, she kept the name. Brilliant. We're culminating in a fantastic scene where, you know, they're, they're in the future and they get to the Devron system, there's nothing there. Oh, what are we going to do? We have to, you know, data again comes through. Well, hey, data. You know, what about an inverse tachyon pulse, which be able to scan beyond the subspace barrier? Okay, how long will it take? 14 hours. Captain, Captain Picard says, right, we're going to stay for six. You know, because they've got notice that, you know, Klingon warships have been dispatched to deal with a renegade Federation starship. And she orders, you know, six more hours. And uh, Jean-Luc goes, no, no, absolutely no. We're going to stay for as long as it takes. And, and that's final. And Beverly just goes, six more hours. May I see you in the ready room? Up. Don't you ever question my orders on the bridge of my ship again. I don't care if you are my ex-captain or my ex-husband. You wouldn't have tolerated that on the bridge of the Enterprise and neither will I. She's so right. And in fairness to Jean-Luc, he immediately goes, mm, I overstepped, I was wrong, you're, you're right. And I love that, that there isn't this protracted, there isn't a big fight or anything about it, because he's wrong and he accepts it. And I, I, I just love it. And it's a beautiful exchange. And she says, remember, if it was anyone else, we wouldn't even be here. We then get this hilariously pointless scene. All right, so you get John Delancey in this old age makeup. Here he goes, hello, uh, where's your mummy? Well, I don't know. And, and then, you know, there's a crucial explanation. Remember, everything that you are and everything that you were and everything that you are to become are all a part of you. But there's absolutely no reason whatsoever why John Delancey needed to be put in makeup for that long. So I'm giving that an up. We do then get a scene where the pastor is being assaulted by two taken up Nagvar, obviously not named yet, class attack ships, only for it then to be rescued by the Dreadnought class 3 nacelled Enterprise D with that lovely phaser cannon, Admiral Riker to the rescue, again taken up, what a fantastic scene that this is. Now the Enterprise D slices through one of the ships, ensuring the other one does a runner. We then get a scene on the bridge of the Enterprise D because the Pasteur's warp core has been breached, you know, the crew was mostly saved, um, except for Nell. Nell dies because, Starfleet, will you stop making your consoles out of rocks that explode, will you? Anyway, so they're on board the bridge of the Enterprise-D and we stop for a second while Riker and Worf start to argue with each other to the point where Picard has to remind them that the Pastor's core is about to breach so the ship has to get out of there. Down. And I'm going to be fair because this is not just limited. So, all right, down first of all, Riker v. Worf on the bridge of the Enterprise-D. So unprofessional, right? But in fact, I'm going to put another down there too. There is a ship about five meters away from you that's about to explode. Why do you need to be reminded of that fact? And it's not isolated to this episode. It happens throughout the franchise that we need to get out of here. So there's a ship about to explode. So the pilot has to wait for the captain to order them to go. And I'm sorry if this is just the way it's done in most active militaries, but that seems like, that seems like a pretty poor way of doing things. Surely, you know, everyone's on board, cool, get me out of here. Minimum safe distance, no? Gah, sorry, but it happens an awful lot in Star Trek and I have to bring it up. Back in the present, there's a framing of the effects of the anomaly on the crew of the Enterprise D. The first thing we see is Geordi's eyes starting to regenerate which, although the poor man's in pain, that could be a good thing. He's, he's gonna get his sight. And then we hear stories of old scars that are beginning to heal. And frankly, that could be good as well. We get the explanation of anti-time and this techno babble taken up. I just love the scene in English data. It's, it's a scene or two later, but the framing of this is done very well. Because initially you're like, well, hang on, what's, what's so wrong with that? You know, old injuries are starting to repair themselves. Alyssa Ogawa loses her baby because the fetal cells revert, revert and revert until eventually they're just not there anymore. And you start to see the severity of the situation. Thankfully, 
Q is able to really hammer home the severity when he brings Picard back to Le Bar in France several million years ago. He manages to really get Picard to understand that this anomaly, which gets bigger the further back in time that you go, anti-time moving backwards, has managed to stop the amino acids from joining together to make the first protein, which effectively means all life on Earth never happened. Jean-Luc, by determinedly searching for this anomaly and using this inverse tachyon pulse, you created the anomaly and well done, you've wiped out all of humanity from ever happening. Now, it would be remiss of me if I didn't put a down in here. And that is that by using the topographic imaging scanner, which is now standard issue aboard the present day Enterprise, but was only postulated by the pre uh, Enterprise of the past at the Daystrom Institute, I love time travel sometimes, they were to see that there's three different inverse tachyon beams, as we know, converging at the same type, same point in space. Now, I'm going to give it a down because it is a self-confessed mistake by the writers. That data says it is as if all three are coming from the Enterprise itself. One of them came from the Pasteur. It's one of those funny little mistakes of the episode. Uh, Ronald D. Moore said that actually, yep, no, that was, it was just a mistake. It was wrong. And it got through all of the edits, it got through everything. And in fact, it was, it was a younger person that spotted it on them and they just went, I can't believe that happened. So down, look, it made it through all of those things, but you can't say the people didn't kind of put their hands in the air and say, yeah. Plus, there's another way of you can another way of like framing it as well. You can go like it's as if all three came from the Enterprise. He doesn't definitively say they all came from the Enterprise. I'm throwing a massive bone here. But what we get after the scene in France is older Picard wakes up and he goes to ten forward. And there's this discussion. Unfortunately, um, it turns out that Troy has died in the intervening years. The feud between Riker and Worf, which I truly don't care about, has gotten so bad. And, you know, they're sitting there, but none of that's important right now. Sorry. Picard walks into 10 forward in his jammies. Uh, and we get, we get a funny scene where he's like, you know, kind of, oh, you know, we've got to go back and I understand it now. And Crusher Picard is like, let's get you to bed. Just will you leave me alone? I, I just love their interplay there. It's very funny. But this scene is... It's crucial because this is this is the pinnacle on which it either works or it doesn't. And he tries to explain the fact that by searching for the very anomaly that they have been, they created it. And because of anti-time, by looking for it in the future, they created the anomaly in the past. Picard can't really find the right words to it, but he has figured it out. Thankfully, Data is able to vocalize Picard's thoughts and that's when everyone comes together and goes hold on I'm with you now the scene that the episode hangs on this either works or it doesn't and I think not only does it work and therefore gets an up the way it comes together including the direction and the music in the scene as well is why this scene in all good things is my latinum up we're very much in the climax of the story now, and by going back to the Devron system in the future, the idea to enter the anomaly and create a static warp shell, again, I love how these scenes are edited together, will enable them to rebuild a subspace barrier that was broken down by the inverse tachyon pulse, allowing the anti-time anomaly to uh, form in the first place. Taking the three ships in is the best way to do it. Now, the problem, as Picard says, is that in both the well, present and the past, the anomalies are so much larger and pose a much greater risk to the ships. Going back to the past, Picard says, right, take us in to create a static warp shell. And Yar says, now hold up. We have obeyed every order, maybe not without question, but we have obeyed every order. But you're now ordering something that could put the ship and the crew in danger. We need an explanation. And that's an up. I'm delighted it's Yar who asked the question, because again, what a fabulous scene for Denise Crosby, and I think it's a brilliant scene overall. Now, Picard delivers um, a rousing speech. Not entirely sure that I would believe him. You know, I know what you're capable of, and look, we may not survive and everything. I was like, yeah, that's great, buddy. Take a shuttle, will you? But anyway, I think it works overall. The three ships go in. 
And unsurprisingly, the anomaly being as large as it was in the past, the past Enterprise D is the first one to explode, which is, which is what a scene, because seeing up the three Enterprises together is, that's, that's a sight. That's a sight. Now, seeing them explode is not as much fun. Seeing the three together, you, the past Enterprise D explodes, the present Enterprise D explodes, and then you're only left with the three nacelled future D, and the anomaly is collapsing. This is working, but it is too much. And you just get that moment of Q leans in and says, so long, Jean-Luc, you had such potential. But then again, all good things must come to an end. Taken up because... Yep, it's the episode's title, and it was so well worked in. The anomaly collapses, thus apparently destroying the Enterprise D, but as the light begins to fade, we see Captain Picard, head in his hands, in the courtroom, taken up. Just brilliant, just two fantastic actors just playing against each other, and Q's final, see you out there. The coda of the Enterprise is, of course, set in Riker's quarters over the poker table. There's just that gas one of, uh, so many hands in a row, how does he do it? And he goes, I cheat. And you have Data's reaction, uh, which I love, by the way. So that's an up, because I think it's quite, quite funny, but also bit rich of the card-counting robot to question cheating. Mm -hmm. Maybe he's going, oh, I'm not the only one. There's an excellent way that this scene is put up, which is when Crusher goes, why do you think the captain told us what might happen in the future, you know, about how we all drifted apart. And Riker says, well, maybe it's to ensure that some things never happen. Of course, he looks very meaningfully at Worf. And I love that. And then Troy enters the room. And for so many times, it, I never picked up on this, but they discuss what could happen while she's not there. They agree that they don't ever want to damage their friendship. She enters the room because that future isn't going to happen, and that's an up from me. I think that was a fantastic way of doing that. The card enters, and it finishes with five cuds, five card stud, nothing's wild, and the sky's the limit. Taken up for one of the best closing shots of any episode of Star Trek ever. All that being said, will you join me at Temporal Observations? All Good Things is one of those episodes that we've had a chance in recent years to revisit quite heavily because we literally have seen what the future looks like for these characters, most notably in Picard's third season, when you get the whole family back together again. So I suppose the first obvious difference, Data had to be resurrected about four million times, but with the events of Star Trek Nemesis that saw Certainly, the data that was in this episode destroyed aboard the Scimitar. We have massive changes to the timeline, and this episode is something like a time capsule, because this anti-time future never happened. So the events of that anti-time future could also never have happened. So what kind of big changes did we see along the way? When Geordi arrives at the vineyard in the anti-time future, it's 2395. The events of Star Trek Picard's first season predominantly take place in 2399, with season 2 and 3 taking place in 2401, 2402, around that time. So this is actually after the time period that the Antiton future was set in. Geordi does indeed have two daughters named Alandra and Sydney. In Picard, there's no mention of a Brett. Of course, doesn't mean that he doesn't exist, but certainly is not mentioned. Nor is Geordi's wife named, and I think that was a very good decision. The Enterprise D itself, of course, would be destroyed in orbit of Viridian 3, or at least half, and for the longest time, the fate of the Enterprise D was just that. It was, you know, from everyone bar Geordi's point of view, it had been, you know, the saucer section crash landed, that was the end of it. No, Geordi, of course, resurrected the Enterprise D to become the enter -Qs, if you like, with the Star Drive section from the USS Syracuse, but it meant that the action and the future moved to the Enterprise E. Uh, Lee, of course, the great joke in Picard's third season of War saying, I prefer the weapon systems on the E. You know, gas. It just meant that we never got that three nacelled dreadnought class Enterprise D. If you look at the individual people, Riker didn't make Admiral, he stayed as a captain. Worf 
did make captain, despite what would happen in Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Of course, Worf, as we know, was on, has still has the most appearances of any actor in Star Trek, went over to DS9, served as a commander over there, the strategic operations officer, fell in love with Terry Farrell's Jadzia Dax. They get married. It's a wonderful time for a couple of years. The Forge, of course, rises to the ranks to become Commodore and ends up taking control of the Fleet Museum. Dr. Crusher, after the events of Star Trek Nemesis, leaves Starfleet altogether. We find out why in Picard's third season. Deanna Troy and Riker get married, and I do think that that was the right decision. We see, of course, the jealousy of Riker in this episode, which in a way does follow through, because by Star Trek Insurrection, as Worf says, your feelings for her never changed, they were just allowed out for a breath of fresh air. This episode also includes, of course, Geordi wearing, well, those contact lenses to suggest he got new eyes. And this was, of course, as soon as they could ditch the visor in the movies, they did. He has the visor for generations, but of course, from first contact onwards, he has those prosthetic eyes. Now, the biggest and most long-lasting temporal changes are, of course, around Picard, and Crusher. Mostly because the Eremotic Syndrome that is introduced in this future, we think for a while that it is a massive part of his story. If, if you think season one of Star Trek Picard, we assume it's his Eremotic Syndrome that kills him. And he is then brought back in this golem body, and it's not really touched upon really in the second season of Picard. It becomes a fairly large plot point in the third season of Picard, I can tell you. This is something we're going to expand upon in a later video, but I wanted to touch on it here, is that here and now in the present of the next generation's all good things, he is diagnosed with a defect of the parietal lobe, okay? So right, that is, that is a thing, that is a, let's call that a fixed point in history. It is this defect that in Q's anti-time future goes on to effectively cause the Eremotic Syndrome. Now, in what we may call the real timeline, it is in fact not a defect of birth at all, but it is the result of his assimilation by the Borg. This defect is, in a manner of speaking, something of a backdoor weapon for the Borg to use his genetic code, his genetic makeup, to eventually, as we see in the third season of Picard, target all of the younger members of Starfleet by effectively beaming code into them via the transporter. Now this is both a massive retcon, but also I, I think it was handled well in Picard. Where, where, there, where there's a question is that if this was in fact a defect created by the Borg, wouldn't Q have been aware of that? This is not a plot hole. I think this is a symptom of a much larger story in the future with Q. And that is something that we are going to... Uh, we'll be revisiting, if you like, the major fiction versus reality video from All Good Things that we did a couple of years ago, because of course we released that before the third season of Picard. But I wanted to leave this, this little nugget in your brain. Q would have been aware that that defect was a result of his assimilation. So what was the anti-time future about? Now, the other fairly large change was that, of course, in our version of history, uh, Dr. Crusher did not go on to Captain the Pastor. In fact, after leaving for Starfleet Medical in Star Trek Nemesis, she then cut off all ties with the rest of her crew as she was pregnant with Jack Crusher. Uh, I, I had to smile I was, when I was re-watching the episode and there's that scene where a lot can happen in 25 years. That's right, for example, magically growing baby fast. Anyway, I've made the joke again. But yes, Jack Crusher is of course conceived and born in this time as well. And this, I think, is probably the biggest change. Uh, well, I suppose Troy not dying is a good change as well. Um, and uh, Data coming back. That's not so, so much a change, he was alive and he went, Jack Crusher, Jack Crusher, conceived and is born. And I think, I think the storyline is stronger for it. Obviously, look, we can joke about timelines of how old is this child aside, but I like to think that this a lot can happen in 25 years line now teases the arrival of Jack. Obviously, they wrote it 30 years ago. They, you know, they did not know Jack was en route, but I like to think that 
in retro in retcon they did other things about this episode for example it was directed by winrick colby um and this was far from his first episode of star trek but this is a hugo award-winning episode of star trek like this did well and i think his direction is a large part of that he was fabulous in directing this he directed such episodes as caretaker and the siege of ar 558 as well man knew what he was doing sadly passed away in 2012. This episode marks the first chronological appearance of the Type 6 shuttle, the Galileo in, on which Yar escorts Picard to the Enterprise D in the past is shown to be a Type 6 shuttle. Now the Type 6 shuttle was not actually introduced until the fifth season episode, Darmok. You had seen other, you know, the, 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 the I'm going to call them the smoother shuttles before that and of course the shuttle pods like the El Baz and the Aldrin. One of the things I like the most about the scene set in the past is sort of a flashback to well these sorts of uniforms but particularly Worf because I did miss his season one Baldrick. Uh, I like I very much like the silver one but this was the original Baldrick that had been designed for John Kalikos in Errand of Mercy in the original series and you can see actually on this Baldrick is the original Klingon emblem that was introduced in that episode. So this is a literally a piece of history that Worf is wearing in this episode. Plus it was good at this point in time to see Worf in red again as it had been a while. Not including of course parallels. There's a funny little easter egg here when Picard is taking over command of the Enterprise D and he says he received his orders from Admiral Nora Sati. Yeah. Yeah, what a nice person she was. And let's not forget the re return of the gold enterprises in the Observation Lounge, including, of course, Andrew Probert's original design for the Ambassador Class Enterprise C. There's a continuity error on the bridge of the Enterprise D in the past that actually makes sense when you think of, um, well, basically thieves exist. So the captain's chair in season one looked nothing like the captain's chair that you would see in season two onwards because someone nicked it. Now for this, no, they were not, they did not then go and build a new captain's chair for the scenes set in the past, even though they did include the steps on the future Enterprise D bridge that you would see in Generations as well. It's quite funny really where they chose to spend their budget for this episode. The scenes set in the future actually foreshadow a lot of what the franchise would do. There is no neutral zone. Now in this version of the future, the Klingon Empire has conquered the Romulan Empire. And while the Romulans still exist, the Klingon Empire is in control and relations between the Klingon Empire and uh, the Federation are a bit frosty. Now this is foreshadowing two things. One, which they would have known about and one which they didn't know about. The one they knew about was that when Worf moved over to DS9, it was the beginning of the Klingon War with the Federation. And that would continue this idea of things did not go well between Starfleet and the, Feder and the Klingon Empire. And thankfully, they do get wrapped up in DS9. Now, the other thing that they didn't know about is what the franchise chose to do with the Romulan Empire, which is in 2009 with Star Trek 09. That team wrote the Romulan supernova into existence, which saw effectively the destruction of the Romulan Star Empire. While the supernova itself doesn't happen in this anti-time future, as evidenced by the outbreak of Torellian Plague, oh dear, on Romulus, therefore Romulus still exists, there is still the breakdown of the Empire, which we do see then in Picard. Different reasons, but same ultimate outcome. The inclusion of the USS Pastor is very interesting because you do hear of medical ships from time to time, but this is the first time we see one exclusively a medical ship on screen. There was talk, we're going way back now into the 60s and even into the early 70s, there was talk of a spin-off show that would have been, you know, effectively like the Hope ship, the medical ship. And it was going to be uh, sort of a jumping off point for Mbenga's character. Now, obviously, Strange New Worlds, we see Joseph Mbenga is a main character, whereas back then he'd only been in one or two episodes. But this idea of a medical ship existed all the way back then as well. There's a rare mention of religion in this episode when Q says, may whatever God you believe in have mercy on your soul. Of course, religion and Star Trek have a fairly interesting history, particularly at this point in its history. Now, while DS9 was on the air and the whole exploration of the Bajorans' relationship with the prophets was very much a thing, bear in mind, you know, humanity was said to have evolved past that by the 24th century. So 
it feels like a deliberate inclusion. A bit of a... Uh, you're in trouble. We get name drops of ships like the Yorktown, which is of course the original, original name for the Enterprise, and the Bozeman, which had appeared in another time travel centric episode, Cause and Effect. There's the revision of the warp scale in this episode. The Pastor moves at warp 13, for example. Obviously, we know from episodes like Timeless and Warp 10 is the theoretical limit. They've obviously just revised the warp scale here. Earl Grey not being programmed into the replicator in the past. I had to giggle at that one. Um, just a, just a bit of a request, really, Star Trek. Uh, stop killing Tasha Yar, please. Just stop it. You've done it a few times now. I mean, this is a hat trick. You know, Yar died originally when Armas tossed her aside. Yar died when sent into the past and tried to escape with her daughter Sila. And Yar dies when the Enterprise D explodes in the anomaly. That's enough. The final shot of the crew sitting around the poker table is of course mirrored later on in Picard's third season, which closes again on the crew playing poker. And this, of course, a very deliberate inclusion by Terry Metalis and the crew of Picard, because thematically, what a better way of closing out the show. And I thought, I, I think, yeah, I, I like that a lot. I think that's one of those things that, that, has, that has lasted very, very well, this image of them playing poker together. This episode was so influential that the Russo brothers quoted all good things as an influence on the biggest box office movie of all time. Avengers Endgame took inspiration from all good things. The last scene between Q and Picard lets us, the viewers, know that the trial never ends. And this, of course, is revisited in Star Trek Picard in the second season and, of course, in that stinger of the third season as well. Q is non-linear and therefore this is, I think that's a very good, it's a good open-ended way to finish the next generation and to tie Picard together with it. So for, for the stumbling blocks that happened in Picard's second season, for the most part, Q's not one of them. And this idea of the trial continuing with Picard as an older man, I really did quite like that. Folks, there it is. All good things. What did you think? Let us know in the comments below. Uh, before you go anywhere, thank you so much again. You're awesome. You're amazing. Your support makes videos like this happen. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm currently struggling to breathe in this uniform, so I'm going to hop out of it now pretty quickly. But please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Follow us over on Twitter, Blue Sky and Instagram. We're at Track Culture or Track Culture YT. Make sure you're following myself at Sean Ferrick. Make sure you're following Chris at Edit Chris Edit as well. You're awesome, you're wonderful. Please don't forget that we will be putting out a poll for you to vote on for this next episode that you want us to cover. So please keep your suggestions coming in as well. We are reading them. Until I see you again, make sure that you live long and prosper. Make sure that you stay well. Make sure that you put positivity out into the world because the more of us do that, the more change that we will make. And may whatever God you believe...